Welcome to another IB Environmental Systems and Societies video. Today's video is part three of the ESS topic 4.2, water access use and security. We'll dive into the practical solutions that can help address water scarcity through conservation and mitigation strategies. We're going to begin by examining domestic conservation techniques. Those are approaches that individuals and households can implement. Then we'll scale up to industrial level conservation and food production systems, exploring innovative approaches that can dramatically reduce agricultural water consumption. And finally, we'll take a look at some successful mitigation strategies from around the world. These case studies show how combining technological policy and behavior approaches can create sustainable water futures, even in the most challenging environments. So let's get into it. These maps show changing global water stress patterns between 1995 and 2025. Water stress is measured as withdrawal percentage of the total available water. Orange and red indicate areas withdrawing more than 20% of the available water, and that's approaching unsustainable levels. Notice how water stress is projected to intensify and expand, particularly in North Africa, the Middle East, Central Asia, and parts of North America and China. This trend reflects growing populations, economic development, and changing precipitation patterns due to climate change. This map highlights groundwater depletion hotspots worldwide. Groundwater aquifers, underground reservoirs that store water, are being depleted faster than they can naturally recharge in many regions. This creates a sustainability crisis as groundwater often provides a critical buffer during droughts and supports both agriculture and drinking water supplies. Once it's depleted, many aquifers take decades or centuries to recover. In coastal areas, excessive groundwater pumping can also lead to saltwater intrusion, and that permanently damages freshwater supplies. The Himalayas represent a critical water tower for Asia, supporting 1.3 billion people across multiple countries. However, this region faces accelerating changes from climate change. Temperatures are warming three times faster than the global average, and that causes rapid glacier retreat. It also creates unpredictable water cycles, and, it, and there's, of course, increased flooding and drought risks. The geopolitical ramifications are pretty profound, too. Economically, competing demands for hydropower and irrigation create tensions. Politically, transboundary water disputes intensify between countries when they're sharing river systems. And socially, millions of people face displacement and livelihood disruption as water patterns change. Water conservation techniques at the domestic level can significantly reduce household water consumption. These approaches include water metering to track usage, rationing during shortages, gray water recycling systems that reuse lightly used water, low flush toilets, and rainwater harvesting. Domestic conservation matters because it directly engages individuals in sustainability practices, and that reduces pressure on municipal water supplies. It can also generate substantial cumulative savings across communities. The most effective conservation programs combine infrastructure improvements with behavioral changes at home. Water metering involves installing devices that measure household water consumption, and that helps create awareness and financial incentives for conservation. Metering works by determining the billing amounts based on actual usage rather than flat rates, and that makes consumers aware of their consumption patterns and helps incentivize reduced use. Studies show that metered households typically reduce water consumption by between 15 and 30 percent compared to households without meters. Benefits include helping identify leaks quickly and reducing their overall water usage. Limitations include upfront installation costs, regular maintenance requirements, and limited effectiveness without the appropriate pricing structures. Water rationing refers to scheduled restrictions on water distribution during periods of water shortage. It works by limiting access during specified times and allocating specific amounts of water per person or household. The image shows Cape Town residents lining up for water during the city's notorious 2018 Day Zero crisis. Benefits include the effectiveness during crises, more equitable access compared to price-based restrictions, rapid consumption reduction, and the potential for creating lasting conservation habits. Limitations include public dissatisfaction, potential health and sanitation issues when it's implemented poorly, and disproportionate impacts on vulnerable populations. There are also some challenges related to enforcement. Gray water recycling involves capturing and reusing lightly used household water from showers, sinks, and laundry for toilet flushing and garden irrigation. Gray water systems can reduce household water consumption by between 30 and 50 percent. 
this system captures water that would otherwise go to waste. It redirects it to appropriate secondary uses, and it reduces the overall freshwater demand. Benefits include significant freshwater consumption reduction. That means people using much less freshwater. Um, it's pretty effective in water scarce regions. And long term, there are a lot of cost savings. Limitations include the requirement for additional plumbing infrastructure. There are also some potential health concerns if it's not managed properly. Insulation costs can be high depending on your location. And of course, there are also ongoing maintenance issues. Low flush toilets represent a simple but effective water conservation technology. Traditional toilets use between five and seven gallons or 20 to 25 liters of water per flush while modern low flush toilets use just 1.3 to 1.6 gallons, which is roughly five to seven liters of water. Benefits of low flush toilets include significant water savings up to 70%, simple one-time installation, long-term cost savings, and compatibility with the existing plumbing infrastructure. Some of the limitations of low flush toilets include initial replacement costs, the potential for multiple flushes with older models, and compatibility issues with some older plumbing systems. Given that toilets account for about a quarter of all the household water use, low flush toilets offer really substantial conservation potential. Rainwater harvesting involves collecting rainfall for household use, typically from roof surfaces. The system collects roof or surface runoff and stores it in tanks or barrels for later use. Some of the benefits of rainwater harvesting include providing a free water source, they reduce stormwater runoff, and they make water more available during some drought periods. Some of the limitations of rainwater harvesting include climate and rainfall dependence, storage space requirements, the risk of some contamination, and maintenance depending on the complexity of the system. Rainwater harvesting is particularly valuable in areas with seasonal rainfall patterns, and that allows households to capture water during wet periods and then store it for use during drier times. Let's transition from household levels to an industrial scale. Water conservation strategies can be applied at an industrial level in food production systems. This addresses the largest water consuming sector because agriculture uses about 70% of all global freshwater withdrawals. Industrial conservation approaches include technological improvements, management practices, and systematic changes in food production. While domestic conservation is still important, the scale of agricultural use means that improvements in this sector offer the greatest potential impact on overall water sustainability. Aquaponics represents an innovative, water-efficient food production system that integrates fish farming with plant cultivation. The system recirculates water between fish tanks and plant growing beds with fish waste fertilizing plants while the plants filter water for the fish. Benefits include using about 90% less water than conventional irrigation. It also enables year-round food production. It creates high-density production in small spaces, and it tends to eliminate most agricultural runoff. Some of the limitations of aquaponics include high initial setup costs, especially at a large scale. There's quite a bit of technical expertise that's needed. It can be energy dependent because you've got to circulate and pump all of that water back and forth between your two systems. And there's some limit to the diversity of crops that can be grown with it. Aquaponics exemplifies a systems-based approach to water conservation because the inputs into one system are generally the outputs of another one. Drip irrigation delivers water directly to plant roots through a network of tubes, emitters, and valves. This targeted approach minimizes evaporation and runoff while controlling precise water application. Benefits of drip irrigation include reducing water use by up to 70% compared to conventional flooding methods, and that decreases weed growth too by targeting water placement right at the plants that you would want to grow. Drip irrigation also minimizes soil erosion, and it's generally compatible with um, fertigation systems, which is a combination irrigation fertilizer system that deliver nutrients along with the irrigation water. Limitations of drip irrigation include really high initial installation costs. They do require quite a bit of regular maintenance. And because of the small size of the pipes in many of these drip irrigation systems, clogging is kind of a problem in areas with hard water that has a lot of mineral content in the water. Drought resistant crops represent a biological approach to agricultural water conservation. These plants, including sorghum, millet, 
quinoa, amaranth, cowpeas, cassava, and chickpeas are all shown here, have adapted root and leaf structures that enhance their water retention and reduce their losses from transpiration. Benefits of these plants include minimal irrigation requirements that reduces overall water consumption. They're also resilient in the face of changing climates, and they tend to maintain yields during periodic droughts. Some of the limitations of using drought-resistant crops include generally lower yields per area than conventional water-intensive crops, there is a limited variety currently available on the market, and consumer acceptance challenges exist when we're introducing unfamiliar or new crops to different markets. Plant-based diets offer a systematic approach to water conservation by shifting food production away from water-intensive animal agriculture. This strategy eliminates all the water that's needed for livestock production, and it grows crops directly for human consumption. Benefits of plant-based diets include drastically reduced water footprints because producing a kilo of beef requires about 15,000 liters of water compared to 1,800 liters for a kilo of wheat. We also get decreased agricultural land requirements, potential human health improvements, and reduced greenhouse gas emissions. Some of the limitations of plant-based diets include cultural resistance to dietary changes. There are also challenges around nutritional planning. There's some economic impacts on livestock sectors and geographic limitations for some of the alternatives. Mitigation strategies to address water scarcity vary widely based on regional conditions, economic resources, and specific water challenges. The examples shown here represent diverse approaches. Singapore's new water recycling program, Israel's drip irrigation technology, East Africa's sand dam projects, Australia's Murray-Darling Basin Plan, and Morocco's integration of desalination with renewable energy. Effective mitigation typically requires combining multiple strategies that are tailored to local conditions and integrating technological, policy, and behavioral approaches. Singapore's new water program represents one of the world's most successful water recycling initiatives. This system treats wastewater through microfiltration, reverse osmosis, and UV disinfection to produce high-quality reclaimed water. The program supplies up to 40% of Singapore's water needs, and that reduces dependence on water imports from Malaysia. Key features include comprehensive public education campaigns to increase acceptance, integration with other water management strategies, and primary use for industrial purposes initially to overcome the psychological barriers. Singapore's success demonstrates how technology and public engagement can transform water security in a location. Israel's pioneering drip irrigation technology exemplifies technological innovation to address water scarcity. This system delivers water directly to plant roots through perforated pipes, and that minimizes losses through evaporation. The technology reduces overall water usage by up to 70% compared to conventional methods. That incorporates the delivery of fertilizers for efficient nutrients, and it employs sophisticated sensors and data analytics for optimization. Israel has transformed desert regions into productive agricultural land through this approach, while becoming a global exporter of water-efficient agricultural technology. Sand dams in East Africa represent a low-tech, community-based approach to water security. These structures retain sand and create a natural water filters in seasonal riverbeds, capturing rainwater during wet seasons for use during dry seasons. Benefits include providing clean water for drinking and irrigation, particularly in arid regions with seasonal rainfall. However, some of the limitations of sand dams include location-specific requirements, limited capacity, and potential ecosystem impacts because you're changing the way that the rivers flow. Australia's Murray-Darling Basin Plan represents a comprehensive policy approach to managing water in a drought-prone region. This integrated strategy implements water trading between agricultural users, it establishes environmental water allocations to protect ecosystems, sets sustainable diversion limits for different uses, it modernized irrigation infrastructure, it implements sophisticated monitoring system, and it incorporated indigenous cultural values in some of the management decisions. This approach balances agricultural, urban, environmental, and cultural water needs through policy mechanisms rather than relying solely on new infrastructure development. If you do a little bit of research, you'll see an image like this one that shows when this plan was initially rolled out, 
there was a huge amount of resistance from local communities. And that's because it had been developed entirely by scientists and technocrats without consulting the communities. So they started over, consulted with local communities, developed a new plan, which was very similar to the original one. But the difference with the second plan was that people accepted it because they were involved. And this demonstrates the importance of community engagement in conservation strategies. We saw that a bit in topic three as it related to biodiversity conservation. Morocco's integration of desalination with renewable energy addresses both water scarcity and sustainability concerns. By powering energy intensive desalination with solar and wind resources, Morocco reduces the carbon footprint of freshwater production. This approach enables coastal water security without excessive greenhouse gas emissions. It demonstrates the potential for technological solutions in arid regions, and it creates a model for sustainable development. The integration of water and energy planning highlights how important systems thinking is to addressing environmental challenges. That's it for part three in our series about ESS topic 4.2, water access, use, and security. Keep these examples and case studies in mind when you're preparing for your exams. They may come in handy for the structured essays in paper two. Until next time, happy learning.